we know that on that first Christmas morning that God came and he invaded our world and changed it forever. And so this morning, if you would, let's open up our Bibles, please, once again uh, to Luke chapter 2. We know, of course, that we are looking at the Christmas story once again this Christmas season. And we're excited this morning as we're going to kind of key in on the shepherds and uh, as they are the ones that uh, are just some ordinary men who have an extraordinary experience in their life. Uh, if you will, you can look there. It tells us in Luke chapter 2, uh, it says there in verse 6 that uh, in the days that Mary was completed, uh, she delivered and brought forth her first son. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. And it says now there, beginning in verse 8, they were in the country shepherds who were out uh, living out in the fields, keeping their watch over the flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you in this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with them an angel, a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. And so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us go to Bethlehem. Let us see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all of those who heard it marveled at those things which were told of them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all of these things and she pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned and glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen and that that was told to them. This morning, I want us to uh, just uh, kind of put ourselves maybe in the place of these shepherds for just a few moments if we could. And the first thing I want you to see about these shepherds is that they're ordinary men who had an extraordinary night. Something happened to them that they never thought would ever ever happen to them in their lives. As a matter of fact, uh, the first thing that we're going to see is that God comes to us no matter who you are. God will come to you no matter who you are. You know, when you talk about the shepherds here in this story, you have to understand uh, who they were in the days that they lived. The shepherds themselves were considered to be the outcast of the day. They were those who uh, basically were uh, those who are kind of uh, on the lower scale of the social life of people in those days. As a matter of fact, uh, they were uh, considered unclean uh, by the religious leaders of the day. They were not allowed to be a part of the temple worship. Uh, the shepherds themselves were uh, also those that, that many would consider that didn't have a good reputation of being honest uh, they were not able to even go and testify in court because they didn't feel like that their word was uh, that of that of integrity, that one you could really trust. As a matter of fact, as you begin to look at this story, you think, well, why in the world would the angels come and give the very first message of the uh, birth of Christ here in this moment? Well, I like how Max Licato said it. I'd like to read that to you. I thought he did a real good job on this, just kind of describing this for just a second. Look at what he said. He said, the announcement of Christmas went first to the shepherds. They didn't ask God if uh, he was sure that he knew what he was doing. Had the angel gone to the theologians, they would have first consulted their commentaries. Had he gone to the elite, they would have looked around to see if anyone was watching. Had he gone to the successful, they would have looked at their calendars to see if it could fit him in the schedule. So they went to the shepherds, men who didn't have a reputation to protect, an ax to grind, or a ladder to climb. Men who didn't know enough to tell God that angels don't sing to sheep and that messiahs are found wrapped in rags, sleeping in a feeding and, and laying in a feeding trough. I thought he did a good job with that. You see, one of the things that I want us to see from the very beginning that tells us in the story here is that 
Why did Jesus come to the shepherds first? I think it's because of the declaration that we see from the angel itself there in verse 10. What does it say? It says that, what? Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to what? All people. You see, there was those religious elite, and there was those that were part of society thought that they were above all, and that they were looking for a Messiah that would be just for them. But here is the announcement that's saying, hey, we're coming to what? Be the Savior of all people. And what that means, folks, it means that God doesn't leave anyone out when it comes to being the Savior of one's life. Listen, the Bible is very clear that if you're willing to look to Jesus and come to Jesus, Jesus is willing to receive and accept you and I. As a matter of fact, it says in John 3, 16, it says what? That whosoever believeth in him should not perish and have everlasting life. Then it says over in Romans 10 and verse 9, it says what? That whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In other words, it's saying this. There is no social class with God. There is no race with God. There is no certain standard you have to meet to come to God. Why? Because the Bible says over in Romans that we are all sinners born in the same condition in need of what? A Savior. And so we see here that God says, I have come to be the Savior of all people. So it doesn't matter the mistakes that you make in life. It doesn't matter the wrongs that you've done towards others, the wrongs you've done towards God. It doesn't matter the standard that you have accomplished in this world. God says, you're all on the same level. And guess what? I accept all who are willing to come to me. So what a glorious moment we see here as we look at God coming to these men who were considered to be the outcast of the day, but yet God includes them in this moment to be His uh, those messengers that will declare the greatest news of all time. So that's the first thing. The second thing I want you to see about the shepherds is this, is that they are also... Uh, you see that God comes to us no matter where we are. Uh, Switch that around there for me there. There you go. Good deal. Uh, No matter where you are. Now, you think about this for just a second. Here are the shepherds, it tells us, and it says they're watching over their flock by night. That means that they're going about their daily or nightly business, you could say. As a matter of fact, they're in the field, and there they are doing their uh, duties as a shepherd and making sure that their flock is took care of night. And then all of a sudden, what happens? They're minding their own business. Uh, Think about it. They're not at church. Are you with me? They're not in a small group talking about and studying the Bible. They are in a field all by themselves, minding their own business, when all of a sudden it tells us what? An angel shows up on the scene. And that angel begins to what? Preach the good news that Jesus Christ has come. And all of a sudden we see, don't you just love this scene? Can you imagine what the scene had to be like? All of a sudden, here's an angel. All of a sudden it says the light fills up with, the the sky fills up with the glory of God. And then there's a great heavenly host of of choir singing and praising God. Here it is, folks. Talk about worship. I think we miss out many times on worship. This is what worship is all about. They declared that Jesus Christ had been born and there was a celebration all over heaven that this had finally took place, that God had brought a Savior for His people. But here they are in the midst of all this, and guess what? God shows up and meets them right where they are. Let me tell you something about God. You can't limit God. God shows up when and where and how He wants to. Anytime He wants to show up, He will, and whatever He wants to do, He will do. And one of the things that's exciting is to watch how God will invade a a life in the midst of their everyday uh, life that they're living. How many of you can remember the moment that God invaded your life for the first time? Raise your hand up. Y'all get a little bit into it. Remember that moment when God invaded your life. You did not expect it to happen at that moment. I can remember that moment in my life. Uh, I was about 10 years old, and I can remember when I had went to my grandmother's uh, to visit, and uh, I was there uh, at uh, her 
house and I had went to a revival service that night and in that moment God was kind of speaking to my heart and I was kind of just not listening to what God said and God said guess what if you're not going to listen to me at home yeah I'm going to keep talking to you I went home that night I laid in the bed and I couldn't sleep and guess what two o'clock in the morning in a bed one hour from my house all of a sudden, God invaded my spirit. And I'm here to tell you, it was the darkest night I'd ever seen that became light all of a sudden that filled that room with the presence of God. And I know, without a shadow of a doubt, that's the night that God invaded my life. And what I'm telling you is this. Do you have that moment? That moment when you know God invaded your life. A moment when the Spirit of God spoke to your heart and you knew it in your spirit and said, Oh, yes. Here it is. The Spirit of God has come. He has brought His love. He's brought His grace. I've experienced His mercy, and His salvation has invaded my life. Listen, folks, it's not about religion. It's not about good works. It is about the moment that the Spirit of God finds you where you are and reveals Himself to you. Remember Paul on the Damascus Road? I mean, here he was. He was on his way to what? Persecute Christians. But all of a sudden, on the way to persecuting Christians, God shows up on the scene right there on the road. And what? The light of Jesus shines upon him. And it is so bright, it blinds him. But it's at that moment that he says, Paul or Saul, why are you persecuting me? He meets him. And guess what? It completely changes his life for all of eternity. Now, I ask you this question. Has God been talking to you lately? Has there been a still, small voice speaking to your heart in the midst of what's going on in your life? You see, whatever you're going in, God's talking. Whatever trials you're going in, God's talking. God is using everything He can to try to let you know He is where you are in whatever you're going through in your life. Don't miss the voice of God. In the midst of this busy season that we talked about last week, listen to me, folks. God is speaking. He is talking to our hearts about what He gave us through His Son, Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you, you can make an ordinary day and an ordinary night, whatever you want to call it, extraordinary when the Spirit of God gets in the middle of it. Amen? Amen. Second of all, I want you to see this. Y'all might get a short message today. I've had a really, really long week, so you might be blessed today with maybe a shorter message. I don't know. We'll just see what happens as the day goes on. Second of all, I want you to see this. With the shepherds, uh, we also see that the, the ordinary... Uh, men who are there have an extraordinary Savior that they're told about. Look at the announcement. I want to break down the announcement that the uh, angel brings to the shepherd. First of all, what does it tell us there? It says, for born unto you this day, it says in verse 11, and the city of David is a what? A Savior. A Savior. Now that word there, first of all, is letting us know that Jesus is not just the Savior, but remember what he said? A Savior for what? All people. He is a Savior for all people. Now, when you talk about that word, I love all the different descriptions that the angel gives Jesus here, and it's, uh, it's good for us to understand that because it gives us the whole picture of what the birth and the life of Jesus is for you and I if we truly put our faith and trust in Him. First of all, when you say He is my Savior, what you're saying is, is that He is your Deliverer. He is a deliverer. That's what that word means. It is a picture of one who has been took captive. One who uh, is in bondage to something or someone. And so what's telling us here is, is that God saw us who was what had been held captive. The Bible says that all what are sinners and we're all what born in our sin and we have what? Been held captive in that sin. And we were being held captive in that sin. And God saw us in our sin. And what did he do? He sent what? A deliverer to come and what? Set us free from our sin. That is, as a deliverer, that means he can deliver you from something that you yourself couldn't deliver yourself from. 
That's what it means. He is the deliverer from our sin. So understand that when he says Savior, man, that, that was a great, uh, a great message, especially for these in this day, because they were looking for a physical deliverer. But see, Savior means what? One that what? Delivers from all. Not just physical. And Jesus can bring some deliverance from all the physical deals that we're dealing with in life. As far as things that, that we feel like are placing us in bondage in this life. But what, what he is, is he's what? The deliverer of that that is spiritually placed us in bondage. And that is what? Our sin. I love what it says over in the book of Colossians. It says that he has delivered us from the power of darkness and he has conveyed us. It says he has transferred us into what? The kingdom of his light. Folks, understand when you're living in darkness, you're looking for light. And so what he's saying is that when Jesus came on the scene, he was the light of the world that invaded the darkness of our sin that would bring a deliverance to all who would put their faith and trust in him. That's the first thing that he says, that Jesus is the Savior to all. But second of all, he says this, that Jesus is the Savior above all. Above all. Uh, what does he say? He is what? Next is Christ the Lord. He is not only the Savior, but Christ the Lord. He gives him, uh, what, two more titles here for us to kind of key in on. First of all, Christ means what? The anointed one of God. He was the anointed one, the one that God himself, God in the flesh comes through Jesus Christ the Son as he's born. He is the anointed one to bring the salvation to man. But not only that, he is what? Christ the Lord. And when it says Lord, it means what? He is above all. It means that uh, there is none like him. There is none above him. He, listen, has also what? Conquered all all below him. In other words, when you and I look at Jesus and know that he is the Christ, the Lord, it means he has declared himself Lord, which means there is nothing or no one that's above him. You see, Satan, what? With all of his angels left heaven, thought that he would declare war against God. And God himself said, listen, you may think you're going to declare war. And guess what? Jesus then comes on earth because Satan has what? Come in and he's what? He's took people captive with sin. He's took captive what? Through the, the death itself. But Jesus has come to do what? To be the Lord over all. Lord over the what? He has went to the cross. What did he do? Went to the cross. He what? Conquered sin. He went to the grave. He rose up. He conquered death. And therefore what? He is Lord over sin. He is Lord over death. Because why? He has conquered it all in himself. Folks, understand that because he is the conqueror over all, then that means he can conquer it all in you if you allow him to live in you. It says over in Romans that we're what? More than conquerors through him, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So there it is. He is what? Jesus, the Savior. He is Christ, the Lord. And then the last thing he says, what? He says, and glory to God in the highest and on earth and good will towards men. Don't miss that part, because this is saying that Jesus is overall good will towards men. Now, when you look at that phrase, you may not recognize what it means in the Greek, but it actually says this in the Greek. It is God's sovereign good pleasure. That's what it means, good will. God's sovereign good pleasure. It is peace towards men whom God's sovereign pleasure rests. What it's saying is this, is that God is completely in control of this universe that he has created and that God is always actively working in this world to bring about his perfect plan and his what is his will what does it say over in Peter it says over in second Peter or chapter 3 and verse 9 it says what it is God's will that no man should perish so God is always at work what to draw men unto himself he is sovereignly working through every event. He is solidly working through the, the circumstances of life. He is working through uh, actually the, the people maybe that you even encounter. He is working all things together for his good because he is sovereignly wanting to what? To bring that 
that peace and that relationship at one with Him. I love how God is always at work, even when we can't see Him at work, to bring people into a saving love and knowledge with Him. Tony Coppola, I love the story that he shares uh, about uh, one time, you know, he's an author and speaker and preacher. He shares a story about one particular time when he went to preach at a church. And uh, this was uh, a, 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 a Pentecostal church. And uh, he said that it, when he got there, you know, they're a little more excited than y'all are. And so he said before the service started, he said they took him in the back. And he said they had about eight men, and they, they, they put him in a uh, – down, got him on his knees and put him in a – you know, and they got in a circle and prayed for him. He said, boy, when they prayed, they prayed. He said he didn't think they were going to get through the prayer time before there was time for him to preach. And he said as they were praying, he said there was a man, as he was praying, he said uh, – um, he prayed this prayer while they were praying. You know, they were there to pray for him, but he started praying for this other guy by the name – of Charlie uh, Stophus, and he said that, um, he basically prayed this, this was in his book, he said, Dear Lord, you know Charlie, he lives in that silver, silver trailer right down the road about a mile. You know the trailer, Lord, just down the road on the right side, this is what he's praying. And he says, God, we need you to do something this morning, because this morning, he's going to leave his wife and his three kids, he just told me. I want you to step in, Lord, do something, bring this family back together. And he said about that time, you know, they've been pressing on his head so long, he didn't think he's going to be able to get up and preach. He said he went and he preached his message. And he said that um, he got in his car and he got on the Pennsylvania turnpike. And as he was going along the road, he noticed a hitchhiker. And uh, he said the Spirit of God told him to pick him up. And I'm going to share with you the words that he said. He said, we drove a few minutes, and I said, hi, my name's Tony. What's yours? He said, my name is Charlie. Guess who? <laughs> he said, I couldn't believe it. Here he was, the man that the man had just prayed for. He said, so I got off the turnpike at the next exit, and I headed back. It got a, a bit uneasy with that, so after a few minutes, he said, hey, mister, where are you taking me, man? You just turned around the other way. I'm taking you back home. He said he narrowed his eyes and asked why. He said, because you just left your wife and your three kids. He said, that blew him away. He said, yeah, uh, that, that's right. And with a shot written all over his face, he said he plastered himself against the car door and never took his eyes off of me. Then I really did him in. I drove right up to the silver trailer where he lived. When I pulled up, his eyes bulged. He asked, how did you know where I live? I said, God told me. He really did because God had told him through the other guy that was praying. When he opened the trailer door, his wife exclaimed, you're back, you're back. And he whispered in her ear. And the more he talked, the bigger her eyes got. And then I said this. The two of you are going to sit down. I'm going to talk to you, and I'm going to tell you too that you must listen to what I say. And man, did they listen. And that afternoon, I led these two people to the Lord. Amen. It's okay to clap every now in the Baptist church. Amen. <laughs> but what I want you to understand is how God wants to bring all people to himself. And he is sovereignly at work doing it his way. And if he is choosing to do that, may we listen to his voice as he calls. The last thing I want you to see here in this message is this, is that the shepherds were the ordinary men that became extraordinary messengers. They're ordinary men who became extraordinary messengers. Look at what happens next. Once they receive the news, it tells us, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass which the Lord has made known to us. What had to happen in the life of these shepherds to experience Jesus? 
First of all, they had to pursue the truth. They had to pursue the truth. You see, they had received the truth of who Jesus was right there on that mountainside. They had heard that He was Christ the Lord. They had heard that He was the the, the one that was the anointed of God who had come. He was the Savior for all people. But even though they had heard it, and even though I had experienced this great emotional moment, they had to make a choice in their hearts, would they pursue this truth or not? Would they stay where they are? Would they think that, oh no man, this has just seemed too unreal, this is, this is just not something, we must be dreaming? No, they had to make a choice to leave where they were and step out by faith and go and find Jesus. You see, that's what has to happen to every experience of relationship with God is that you have to pursue the truth of who He is and what He's done for you. You see, Jesus Christ declared it. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And He said these words, what? It is the truth that sets you free. The truth of Jesus. The the Christmas story that starts with the birth, that goes all the way through a life that was, what, perfect, that ends up with a place that where Jesus resurrected from the grave and brought eternal life to you and to me. Pursuing truth. You see, we're living in a world that doesn't believe in absolute truth. We're believing in a world where they are not looking to Jesus as the truth, and there's so many that are rejecting the truth of who Christ is. But my friends, if you're willing in your life, there had to be a moment in my life when I said, listen, I don't quite understand it all. I can't comprehend it all in my life, but I know this by faith, I'm going to, I pursued the truth of what Jesus did for me. And the moment I pursued the truth, I found the truth because the truth came in me and the truth transformed me for all of eternity. What I'm telling you folks is this, is that you can have an emotional moment You can have a moment when you hear truth, but still not experience truth. You see, truth only comes when he what? When Jesus invades your heart and you realize that you are a sinner separated from God. You realize that, hey, I can't do anything to save myself. I must what? Allow what he did for me on the cross to become a reality in my heart. Put my faith and trust in him. Accept him as my what? Lord and Savior. And he comes in, and that truth sets me free. Pursue the truth this morning if you have not done that in your life. You see, one of the greatest things about Christmas is it's a salvation moment. I mean, Christmas is a moment to truly let people know that Jesus Christ came into the world to save people from their sin. And guess what? The next thing you see is what we need to be doing all throughout this Christmas season and all throughout the year. That is to what? Proclaim the truth. Boy, I love the story of these shepherds here. It says that they they went in haste and they found Jesus, it says. And now it says, when they had seen him, they what? Made widely known the saying which was told of them concerning this child And all of those who heard it, they marveled at all the things which were told of them by the shepherds. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told to them. Let me tell you something. There was no mistake who they had met. It was no mistake at what they had encountered. And guess what? These outcasters became newscasters. They all of a sudden, my friend, were able to say, listen, We've got something you need to hear about. It says that everywhere they went, everyone they met, they were declaring who Jesus Christ was and how they had encountered Him and how He had transformed them. It says that everywhere they went, they were glorifying and praising God. How about you? How about me? Think about this. We are those messengers today as believers who have experienced the extraordinary with God. We have a message that can transform a life and a world. But I ask you this question, are we sharing that message with the world around us? Do, do Do people see the excitement 
that you feel like was here at this moment. They were what? Glorifying and praising God wherever they went. Do they see that in you? Where Everywhere you're going from day to day, do they see you at work glorifying and praising God? Are they seeing you in those moments of, of, of tribulation and trials glorifying and praising God? Are they seeing you at school, kids, students, glorifying and praising God? We are the messengers who have great joy. Here's the problem. We're losing the joy because we've lost sight of Jesus and what He truly has done for us. Amen? Because I'm telling you, if you can come back to the manger, go to the cross, and to the grave where the resurrection took place, that, my friend, should excite you and I because without that, we have no hope. We're doomed for all of eternity. But because of Jesus and that first Christmas morning when we see God's love wrapped up there who comes to us, we have a message that can bring great joy. Where is the joy in the house of the Lord? You see, folks, when you are a messenger and you have great joy, it means you take every opportunity you can to let someone know about Jesus. I uh, was reading the story of a pastor, Pastor Wallace in Michigan, Rochester, Michigan. He said he went one day to get a haircut and, um, you know, went to one of these places where you can go in, you know, and someone there, you don't have a regular person that does it. They just come up and they cut your hair, kind of like great clips that some of you go to. You know, oh, that's free advertisement, wasn't it? Amen. Said he got this uh, lady that was a Muslim woman and uh, said he just got started talking to her. And he basically just, as they were talking, he says, I'm here to get the haircut. He said, because later on today, I've got to do a funeral. And um, at that time, the lady said these words to him. He said, well, I was once asked to cut the hair of a dead man. They's going to pay me $150 to do it but I wouldn't do it. He said, well, why wouldn't you do it? He said, man, I, I didn't want to touch the dead because I was afraid that they'd sit up. And that pastor at that moment said, I know someone who did. And she looked with great amazement. You did? He said, yeah, I know someone who did. You're kidding. No. And he said, at that moment, he was able to share about Jesus all the way from the birth to the resurrection of how he would. He came up out of the grave on the third day. He said this Muslim woman was just amazed. She had never heard the story. And so when he got ready to leave, she said this. She says, are you going to keep coming here? And he said, I'll come back. She says, I wish you would because I would really like to know more. You see, there's a world out there that needs to know more. They need to know the true message of Christmas. They need to know what Jesus did. They need to know the true meaning of Christmas. It's not all this commercial stuff that's, that's been made up and brought up in this world. They need to know it's because of God's love for them that, they, that He came and He brought the Christ child who grew up to become what? The Savior of our sin. What's the song we sung this morning? Go what? Tell it on the mountain. Over the hills. And what? What's that word? What's that word? Everywhere. What's that word? Everywhere. What's that word? Everywhere. I still ain't heard all of you. What's the word? Everywhere. There you go. Tell it everywhere you go. Amen. They got loud, and I appreciate that, so do it. What I'm saying to you folks is this. We have a truth to proclaim. It is a truth, my friend, that's the greatest truth of all time. And I'm encouraging all of us to think about this message that's extraordinary. Will you this Christmas be that messenger? But more than that, this Christmas... Will you be one that experiences Jesus in your life if you've never experienced Him as Lord and Savior? Would you please stand to your feet?
Father God, we ask, Lord, right now, Father, as we've just uh, just took the, the simple story that has been the greatest story of all time, and Lord, we've just laid it out there just as your scripture has said. But God, we know, Lord, that it is a great love that we are experiencing even at this moment, God, as your presence, God, has been speaking to hearts this morning. Lord, I pray, Father, right now, Lord, uh, God, for anyone today, God, that that Lord doesn't know, that they know you as Lord and Savior of their hearts, God. I pray if you've spoken to their hearts today, that today could be the day, God, that you invade their lives and change them for all of eternity. But Lord, I pray for us as believers who do know the truth. Lord, have we forgotten just how extraordinary God that moment was when we met you that moment when you invaded our hearts and filled us with a hope and a joy and a forgiveness and eternal life God I pray Father right now that your spirit Lord would just invade us God again with that hope and that love and that God just that 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 passion to want to let a world know that we know Jesus and that we want Jesus to be known in their hearts. Lord, we love you and ask God right now if there's one today that needs to make that decision that they will do that right here, right now in this place. With our heads bowed, with our eyes closed and the, the music is, is beginning to play. Maybe you need to come to this altar and pray. Maybe there's...